welcome to Brainwaves Bistro. Grab yourselves a cuppa, kick back, and join us for mental health talk with a positive vibe. Here's Julianne. I am delighted to introduce leading Australian plastic and reconstructive surgeon, Dr. John Flood, and of course my co-host, Barb Smith, who needs no embellishment at all. Both John and Barb, hi to you both. Hi, Julianne. Hi, Barb. Hi there. Hi. John, when we talk plastic surgery, that includes cosmetic, restorative and reconstructive surgery. But in Australia, we are looking at two out of three people under 70 requiring treatments for skin cancer. Cancer surgery is one area that requires your specialised skills, John. I know you do quite a bit of it. This rate of skin cancer is unsurpassed in, in other areas of the world. A statistic, I think, resulting from our sometimes fierce sun and climate. But moving on to cosmetic surgery, of note, and according to the Australasian College of Cosmetic Surgery and Medicine, more than a third of Australians are, as we speak, considering cosmetic surgery. And in the US, according to our Real Self Culture Report, 24% of Americans have undergone a cosmetic treatment or procedure. People everywhere are more open to the prospect of cosmetic surgery as part of a plastic surgery revolution. No longer is it just in the realm of the Dolly Partons and the Kardashians. We are moving on. And, John, you have studied and honed your skills in both Australia as well as in the U.S., in Texas, I believe, you undertook a fellowship involving training in all aspects of facial surgery, both acute trauma and post-traumatic reconstruction, and then on to facial aesthetic surgery. You are on the editorial board for selective readings in plastic surgery, which is used in the curriculum for plastic surgical trainees right around the world, and the board is based in Texas. And most importantly, you give back. You participate in an organisation called Interplast and involves trips to the Marshall Islands and Fiji in your past. And we will hear more about your endeavours to help later on. My first question is, what is the story behind your journey into such a specialised field? It really dates back to my father was a surgeon, a general surgeon, and at the age of 12, in those days, you could in, be ushered into the back of the theatre, be introduced to a patient, the charge nurse, and had the opportunity to watch an operation. And I had my first epiphany then thinking, I want to be a surgeon like my dad. He, he saved someone's life. It was an abdominal operation. And it sort of stuck with me to think I'd love to be a surgeon. And so I did medicine and I wanted to be a surgeon and I always wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon because I like the ideas of broken bones and fixing them, making them straight. And after all, orthopedics comes from the word ortho, meaning straight and pediatrics as in children to fix straight bones in kids. And during my journey in orthopedics, I was told to go and learn some plastic surgery because the plastic surgeons, my boss said to me, think differently. They deal with soft tissues. They understand bones as well. They know nerves and they do cosmetic surgery and they're an interesting specialty. So go and spend some time. And I still remember one day being invited onto the surgical ward to see a young boy who was 14, terribly burnt, had missed part of his nose and had been burnt off when he was a child. He was very forlorn and withdrawn. He was hiding, looking into his wardrobe on the surgical ward. Admittedly, it was an adolescent ward with a lot of kids running around, all mucking around and causing absolute nightmare for the charge nurses. And I introduced myself, and he couldn't even look at me. And I got to know him, and over a month, we then reconstructed his nose in three operations. And one day, I came onto the surgical ward to look for him. And I said to the charge nurse, Lisa, I said, where's, where's Toby? And she goes, have a look over there. 
And there he was with his arm around a young girl, and he was in charge of the pool table. And I couldn't believe it. And that's when I had my second epiphany. I thought, wow, we just didn't do an operation on this guy. We changed his whole demeanor, his whole self-esteem, who he was. And from that on, I went back to my boss the next day, and I said, I can't do orthopedics anymore. I'm going to have to change my career direction. And that was it. Wow. What a wonderful story and what a rewarding career has come out of out of uh, that experience with that young boy. And so many people must be so grateful to you. And I, I, I just want to know now, what is your preferred area of practice and, and why? I think I enjoy facial surgery. Uh, as a plastic surgeon, when I was on at St Vincent's Hospital, we did general plastic surgery, which took the gamut of hand surgery, acute hand surgery, microsurgery, sewing on fingers, fixing up people's faces after car accidents or assaults in, around King's Cross, working with the breast surgeons to reconstruct breasts, the head and neck surgeons doing major cancer work, bringing bones, microvasculary, reconstructing jaws. But really getting away from the body, to me, it was really the face because that's what brought me back to why I became a plastic surgeon in the first place, away from the limbs of an orthopedic surgeon's career. And I was reminded of when I was a medical student doing psychiatry, the professor of psychiatry had suffered fairly significant burns and was hard to, at times, look at. And it was terrible for me when I reflected on that. And one day he said to us at a lecture, he said, remember, the most powerful psychotherapeutic tool there is available is the surgeon's scalpel. And he then told his story of significant burns and reconstruction, skin grafting from a plastic surgeon. And he said to me after that lecture, he said, I couldn't even look at myself and look at me now. You know, I can lecture, I have a life, and sure, I've got scars. And I thought, wow, that's it. Plastic surgery of the face is exactly what Harold Gillies did in World War One, making fighter pilots' faces again from tube pedicles. So for me, that's why I enjoy the face, because it's not just surgery. You're dealing with someone's emotions. You can't hide the results. You can't say that's a great result when it looks terrible. Anybody can see it. A five-year-old can point their finger at a result and the patient can see the results in a mirror. So for me, I find it very rewarding yet very challenging. Oh, look, that is wonderful. But self-esteem to be the best you can be, I think the work you do is wonderful, and particularly in restorative areas. But when does it become a mental health hazard and when do you see someone having unrealistic expectations uh, that that you no one can fulfill and and what do you say and how do you advise them great question and it's something you're forever learning i've always got my antennae up to make sure that they're going into an operation for the right reasons because I've been caught in the past. I've been caught where in the past a, a, a lady who who wanted to have a, a facelift and we went through all the technical aspects of the operation and what she would look like. And I did the operation and she came back and everything had healed well. And initially she was pleased because there was no complications, which is always the first thing. Firstly, do no harm. But then it evolved over about three or four months. She admitted that it didn't help alleviate her mood. Mm. And her mood was a major depression. And she was hoping surgery would fix her depression and change her life. And I completely missed that. And later on, she acknowledged that, yes, she looked better but it hadn't alleviated her mood because sadly she had a fairly significant endogenous depression. So for her, that was completely missed from what was hidden about her psychiatrist. And from then on, I really thought, look, I've got to get into not only mental state, but what, what other health issues that I'm not a psychiatrist in to liaise with 
their psychiatrists or psychologists. I'm very involved with that now. If anyone's got any mental health issues to run through, because still people who have depression can still have surgery, that's fine. But it's really what their what the impetus is and what their expectations are. It's no different to a young boy who was a young man I did recently where I was about to operate and I said, what do you hope to get out of having your ears set back? You know, they are very prominent. You're teased at school. He said, oh, this is going to get me a really good girlfriend. And I was thinking, well, it may, but it may not. So I'm not sure we're doing this for the right reason. I hope this is more about esteem and a number of other issues. So at the moment, I'm just sort of, waiting to get him back for another consultation, maybe suggest talking, a suggestion of seeing a psychologist. Um, so there are those aspects. Yeah, yeah, and that is, it's with experience you learn to discern. Uh, but what, is it a hazard also social media? Um, what are the negatives that come out of social media? I gather you're going to say that over idealist, uh, idealized expectation of perfection. Um, are we overindulging in our expectations with social media? I think we are. I, I'm personally not on social media. Um, I, I just, I don't engage with it. I'd rather just engage with people in the real world i'm not so that's a philosophical thing i take i just don't have the time for social media because i look at sometimes my children how they spend their time on social media and the younger people who come in and see me uh i'm worried that for young women a lot of social media is not real when they're posting images of yeah. whether they're overseas or at a party those parties could have been a week old and they're trying to make out as if it's happening now. They're looking beautiful on a beach when, in fact, it was an image of them taken a year ago or someone else. They're using filters. They're not really – they're trying to provide this idealised world that if you're a surgeon engaging in that, that could be incredibly difficult. I, to be honest, I gave up doing um, rhinoplasty about – Ooh, just as social media was coming in because I was seeing patients coming to see me who were wanting to see noses like Kim Kardashian, wanting to look like different models. And I was thinking, gee, I'm not sure whether I can sort of provide those results on photographs that I don't even know if they're even real images of people's noses. And You do a young woman's rhinoplasty and she's initially very happy. You've taken the bump off her nose. She's breathing well. And out of the blue, she appears a year later and says, look, look at my nose. And you're going, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. She goes, look at this image I took on Saturday night. And it's a poor selfie, bad angle, bad lighting. And that's now her perception of what her nose looks like to others. And you Wow, it was it was confronting for me because for me then I thought I'm not sure in the world of rhinoplasty now I can achieve sustainable results when I'm up against social media and bad photography. And some of my friends who still do it say, yeah, it is an absolute challenge. Yeah, people's unrealistic expectations. Um, I'm going to ask you about popping off overseas to have that cheap, quick fix. I know in Korea, which I was amazed when I read this, that uh, South Korea has the leading per capita statistic for cosmetic surgery and is actually touted as the hub for technological advancement in plastic surgery, but there are dangers in, as I said, dashing off overseas for cheap and quick fixes. Can you uh, elaborate on that point? Yes, I think what I'm seeing is that patients will go over there primarily for cost. They can save money and then they can justify saving money on, well, I'll have a holiday as well. I'll recuperate and my friends won't know I've been away and I'll come back looking refreshed and much better than having surgery here. The problem what I see is patients when they have a complication. So when everything goes well, 
I don't have an issue with it. Good luck to people. They have a choice. The problem is when there's a complication and you're then trying to sort out that complication. Because the first thing, if I have a complication sent to me from elsewhere, from a colleague, or you ring them, you get the operative notes, you find out exactly what was done. You can get as much good information to sort of move on from there. When patients come from overseas, often you have a paucity of information of what operation was done. Usually they don't really know the the details. And especially with examples like breast implants, patients think they're they're having a a proper medical grade implant being placed in where at times it may not be the implant that they thought they were having placed in there. They may have got an infection. No swabs have been taken or culture. They can't remember what antibiotics are, they've been taken. Then they developed infection, problems with wound healing, breast implant extrusion, scarring. And you feel for these patients because you're thinking, wow, they've tried to save some money and go it alone. Now they're back in a system here of trying to sort out a mess. And it can be costly for them because the private insurance, it can be then be expensive to fix up. And if they elect to go through the public system, they're really then placed in a waiting list or have to go through the emergency department if if we're dealing with acute soft tissue loss or infections. So uh, I I feel very anxious about when patients say, I'm going to go overseas for surgery, even what some people say, just a little bit of liposuction. If I've heard that story before, a little bit of liposuction, even though it's a little incision maybe around the tummy, there's a large surface area under the skin where that cannula is moving through fat. And if it's done in an aseptic environment, then you can get a very nasty infection. And I still remember at St. Vincent's having a young lady where she sloughed her abdominal wall skin and fat completely, needing skin grafts for a little bit of liposuction. So well, I'm very anxious about it, to be honest. I say to my patients or friends, say, oh, look, I could dart overseas. I say, look, you're better off just saving up, having it done here, because it's all about the warranty. If you've got a problem, the surgeon with any ethics will follow you through make sure everything's okay. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Now, I'm going to tell you, in July 2022, 2023, correct me if I'm wrong, new safeguards in Australian practice were implemented to protect cosmetic surgery patients. And this involved the Australian Medical Board and accreditation. Would you like to comment there? Look, it's... It's interesting. I think things had to be done. I can see the government and the health department's response where what was really going on, what they call cowboys, there was, it was really an unregulated area because most people, if they're thinking of surgery, you go and see a nominated neurosurgeon, heart surgeon. It was all pretty much looking at everyone's turf. But cosmetic surgery really, apart from plastic surgeons, we like to think that with our training, not own cosmetic surgery, but feel very bona fide that we've done sufficient training and have the ethics of having all the other surgery that we can perform in terms of reconstruction, that we can only do cosmetic surgery, but we can also fix up any problems on the basis of our reconstructive skills. Yeah. With the cosmetic, with, with cosmetic, there was really no formal training for a number of people. You could be a GP on Friday, do a weekend course, and on Monday, you can call yourself legitimately a cosmetic surgeon. And you could watch a videotape, uh, be on a webinar, do an operation, a blepharoplasty, take out too much skin. A person can't close their eyes, ends up at a plastic surgeon or an eye doctor needing skin grafts. They could have had liposuction, like that case, end up in hospital with a pierced abdomen, bowel leak, etc. So I can understand why the health department stepped in for that. Yet at the same time, I'm respectful that a number of my colleagues are currently taking APRA to court 
over what they perceive as overreach and overregulation. Because at the moment, there are some elements that I feel that patients to a degree have to be respected in terms of uh, or cared for and correct information being provided for them. But we have to be very careful that we don't create a nanny state where if someone wants to have an operation, say a lady the other day wanted to have a facelift, she now requires her general practitioner to refer her. She doesn't really know the GP, but went to a GP. He referred her to see me. I then have to make sure she doesn't have body dysmorphic. That's fine. I, we ran through a questionnaire. She now can't book for an operation, even though we thought she had reasonable expectations, etc. She wants to go ahead. She now has to come back for a second consultation, which I've normally done, but now that's regulated. At the second consultation, she's not allowed to book any operation for at least another one to two weeks for a cooling off. And as she said to me, look, John, this is all, I know who I am. What is it to the health department to tell me what I can do? Yet a friend of mine can go off and have bariatric surgery, a major abdominal operation, so they can lose weight. And so I can hear, I see her point. Yeah. So I think I have a little bit of misgivings that I, I hope this is just not all everybody's being caught in one big net and that patients really are going to benefit from the regulations. But, um, I'm always, I'm always a little bit worried about over regulations and punitive damages against, you know, doctors who, may be perceived by doing the wrong thing when, in fact, it's just an honest mistake. And when I say mistake, I mean in terms of scheduling bookings. You can have your practice audited now about seeing what patients are being having cosmetic surgery, how many consults they've had, calling off period, things that I've done for many years anyway, just as a natural part of my practice. But when it's regulated, oh, I don't know. It's not regulated in any other aspect of surgery. So I'm just curious about where it'll all go. And that's why this court case will be very interesting. Well, we'll be listening and watching. And um, now I'm going to move on to something. And thank you for your input there. Like me, or I say, like I, I'm a great supporter of Medicine Sans Frontier and have been for many years, Doctors Without Borders, an international focus with volunteer doctors and nurses. But you are a supporter also, but you're also very much involved with the wonderful work that Interplast, volunteering in such places as Fiji and the Marshall Islands, I think I have that right. Tell us a little bit about Interplast and your work and how it benefits the world. Interplast is a plastic surgical association. We're going out to countries in the Pacific, and whether it's Fiji, Solomon Islands, Kiribati, Samoa, done in conjunction with Rotary. So when I've been to Fiji, Marshall Islands, it was the local Rotarian director there who helped co-fund the, the trip and he used the Surgeons will go for a fortnight, use a couple of surgeons, a couple of nurses, one or two anaesthetists. And the great thing about Interplast is you take all your own instruments, all your own sutures, anaesthetic agents, and the hospital gives you their theatre for a couple of weeks. And you really just open up an outpatient clinic for whoever wants to attend to see what you can do. And usually in the first week, there are people lining up and it's all booked but by the into the second week, you've got kids coming from all over the place hearing about a little kid in their village who had a cleft lip who's been repaired by a surgeon. So the next minute, a little kid in a village or in a mountain will then be escorted down to see if he can have an operation. Or someone who's had a burn, unstable burn for many years. And I still remember in Fiji, a, a lovely young girl who sadly was caught in a a fire and had her wrist completely flexed down where her fingers were touching her forearm and a bad neck contracture. And over a morning, my colleague and I 
release the, gra- the, the scarring, put some skin grafting in, and just to see her mother's elation, to see her daughter be able to have her neck straight, her hand out straight, you know, you can't put a price on that. And they're just very grateful people for whatever we can do. So Interplast is just voluntary. I haven't done much in recent years due to other other commitments with other sort of teaching associations, but it's very, it's wonderful. And it was started out of Melbourne in conjunction with Rotary. Um, the Sand Hospital does a similar project itself up through Nepal for many years. One of the plastic surgeons, Charles Sharp, ran a cleft lip and palate and burns clinic up in Nepal uh, through the Adventist Hospital based on a similar concept to Interplast. Well, it is just wonderful to hear how you give back and how your colleagues give back to the underprivileged and to the world. And it's a privilege also to have you on our show today, John. Um, I think we've learned so much and I am personally very grateful to you. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And now, Barb, my wonderful co-host and technician who gets us a lot of problems, is going to tell you a little bit or just briefly about mental health research and the Black Dog Institute. Barb? That's right, Julianne. Yes, if, if the listeners could please Google the Black Dog Institute. It's a not-for-profit that helps uh, people with research and they do great work. And as Julianne often says to me, no donation is too small. So I'd like to finish off with that and say thanks, Julianne and Dr. Flood, for today's episode. Enjoy our health and well-being today and an even better one tomorrow.